The best thing that you can do is asking people why we're doing this, like being curious. Creating a team from zero is really complex. It's really hard to put some people together and make them work as a team. The role is in a sandwich. You have many inputs from different places. There are different things that are happening at the same time. It's all the time like that. <laughs> Hi, I'm Maria, and this is the Agile State of Mind. Welcome. And this is the third episode of the Agile Leadership Podcast, where I deconstruct the role of an engineering manager and try to make sense of the role confusion and understand the challenges in the transition from a developer to a manager. You can find this interview both on YouTube and as a podcast. See the links in the description below. And today I have an actual engineering manager with me, Miguel Angel Gomez. Hola, Miguel. Hi, Maria. How are you doing? I'm good. Thank you. Nice to have you here with me. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. And hopefully this is going to be a really interesting podcast today. Yeah, let's hope so. So Miguel is an engineering manager at Bumble. And that's actually the second time you are an engineering manager, right? Right. Yeah, the first time it was in free now. And currently, yeah, I'm working in Bumble as engineering manager since almost a year. Wow. So we have a double engineering manager here, and that would be great to deconstruct a bit if the role is the same in both companies, what are the differences? And that's actually interesting because previously at FreeNow, you transitioned from Android chapter lead to an engineering manager. So that's something that's interesting too. And that was a transition for the whole company. So nobody was an engineering manager before and everybody had to find their way. And even prior to that, you have been an Android developer. So you had like two transitions in free now, and I would like to talk about that. But well, let's start from Bumble. For those who are not familiar with Bumble, Bumble is not just a dating app. It's actually, as they say, a social network because you can also find a BFF, right, on Bumble. So it's not only about dating, it's also about friendship and networking. And what distinguishes Bumble from other dating apps is that after a match where two people press like to each other, the woman needs to do the first step, right? Right. Yeah, it's basically that differentiates Bumble from other dating apps, empowering women and making the woman make the first move. So are you an actual dating expert now? Can you share with us what's online dating all about? Do you, can you share some trends of online dating with us? I would not say that I am an expert in online dating, but I, I think the business is really interesting. Many of the people have moved to trying more online dating with different apps, not only Bumble, Tinder, many others that are from some niche communities. So yeah, it's, it's, a, it's an environment that has been growing a lot in the last years. Something that we have seen is that there are many ways of dating differently around the world. How culturally this path of dating online is is different. I would say that in many of the countries, there is always like the dating app of that place you know because she's very attached to the cultural way of how they do or did in real life dating and move it into virtual or online way so okay, yeah that's interesting that's why some of the biggest companies on dating try to fit in a broader way how to approach the online dating this is how we try to do it but making the differentiation in bumble of won't make the first move and empowering some of the female communities in, in all the countries. That's nice. That's like breaking the stereotype that the man has to always make the first move. So yeah. it's, it's like crossing these boundaries. And I checked the profile on Instagram of Bumble and I really like the tone and the style of communication. It was very inclusive and very like empowering. So yeah, it seems interesting company to work for. But well, it is, it is. <laughs> so let's go back to what we are here for. So apart from that, just to finish about you, you are also an avid motorcycle rider and you like to paint in your spare time. Yeah, those are part of my hobbies that I very frequently try to do. And do you feel that 
having some hobbies apart from coding or like management, does it help you somehow like to disconnect? Do you see importance of disconnecting from work? For me, it's very, it's very important. It's good to have also different perspective from different communities, like not only being part of like the software development environment or the engineering side of the things, but also having different perspective from different people. In my case, for example, as I work in some dating app, it's also interesting to ask people from other type of communities and other type of backgrounds, how they do that, if they have tried or not. So it's also a way of disconnecting, but also relating to what I do. Yeah, but I think it's very important to disconnect and do something different because the role of engineering manager requires a lot of psychology, a lot of getting deep into discussions and analyzing things. And sometimes you just need to unplug to be able to do the best when you are in the actual work. It's good for the mind to sometimes just close up and do something different, go somewhere, take some holidays, because that helps the brain to detach, think differently, make the best of the best when you when you are actually doing the job. This is something that we start, I think, to appreciate more these days, taking some time off, disconnect. The companies give like unlimited number of vacation days because, you know, your brain can explode at some point when you always like are so focused. And especially if you have to deal with so many people going back to free now. You started as an Android developer and then you got promoted to chapter lead. How was the transition? Can you explain a little bit? Were you interested in it? How did it happen? What were the challenges of, of that transition? The biggest challenge that I, that I had at that point was that many of the people that I have been working with, they would have become like my manages so that was a really challenging thing was i interested or not yes i was very interested at that point of my career when i started in free now i already realized that i was very interested into delivering more value than just actually doing coding i realized that i also was good communicating some of the technical things in a non-technical way to some of the people that were working with me uh, like for example pms designers stakeholders. So for me, it was very easy to share some of the problematics that we have in different uh, areas of the engineering side. And I realized like, okay, this is something that I will actually explore a little bit more. And after taking that path, which was also interesting because I had to learn many things of how to manage people, how to manage situations, how to assume certain responsibilities that are broader than just my individual work, how to motivate people to help them grow, to think more in a business way, how to understand the business value of what we are doing, understanding the why, what is the purpose, where is the income, what is the return of investment of what we do. So that, that it was a, a very interesting uh, learning path, but I think was super, super excited uh, on that moment. But yeah, for me, the biggest challenge was that like at, at some point, being the manager of some of my colleagues was not easy because not everyone always received that as a, as easy as it could look like. But I think I did it good way. In the end, of course, not not all the people was very keen to accept it, but I had to prove it and I had to show why I was there, what was the value that I was giving. And yeah, I think it went good. Okay, so you took it as a challenge that you wanted to prove yourself as well. One of the things that you mentioned, I think is one of the most important and like challenging things. And it apparently it was pretty natural for you. For example, what you mentioned about like connecting with different stakeholders, which in the end creates a lot of pressure, a lot of stress because, you know, you have to go put yourself out there, talk to people you don't didn't know at the beginning so well, because you are mentioning that. And I understand a big part of becoming a leader is also getting to know the product from different angles, as you mentioned. So how did you do that? What did you do to understand better the product? I think the best thing that you can do as engineer or developer that want to follow this path is making questions, is asking people why we're doing this, like being curious, trying to understand different perspective of what we are doing, like ask. And asking to uh, whom, who did you ask these questions to? First of all, the, the nearest person that you have usually in your team is the PM who knows what 
what is mm -hmm. that needs to be done and why it needs to be done. So I think that's very, very important. Like having a close relationship with product manager. Also, you have some engineering leads. Of course, I, it depends on the company. You could have different names like tribe lead, engineering manager, uh, VP of engineering, uh, head of engineering. Those people also have a really good context of, of what is going on in the business, in the product, in the why. So probably making those questions like say, Meeting someone and once with some of these people is helpful just for curiosity, just to understand what is going on. And also, you will realize that many of the people that you contact with is very open to share with you uh, many of the things. And probably you are going to be uh, someone that they are going to have to count because you are asking. They are going to realize that there is someone that is um, iOS developer, Android developer, that is asking for certain things that not other people is asking. So they are going to already have you as a point of contact for certain things. So that also helps you to grow in that way. And, and yeah, that's, I think that's the most important one. Okay. So that's important even before you transition to a manager, right? If you are thinking about maybe that's a path for you, it's good to already start reaching out to people and getting to know more. So they, they start recognizing you as a partner. Exactly. It's always important to make questions to the people that is taking decisions and understanding why. Further you go in the career, you can start challenging some of the things and so on, but at the beginning, what is important is to be curious, is try to understand. Be curious. That's our first tip. Yeah. Okay. So now my question would be, you were transitioning from a developer that was new, you were first time manager. Did you have any help from other managers, like your manager that you were reporting to, but maybe also some other chapter lead that were in the company? Was there some mentoring? The manager was setting expectations towards you. How important is that? Uh, I think it's very important, actually. It's good to have someone that helps you to deal with certain situations when these situations are the first time that you have to deal with them. In Finao, actually, yeah, I, I got a, a lot of support from different people, other engineering managers, my engineer, my, my engineering manager at that point. We started with some sort of part of getting to me some uh, responsibilities, getting introduction to some topics that were broader than my own team. And yeah, this was like a, a small part that we created to, to follow up. Coaching and helping people to become manager is something very important and companies do, do this in very different ways. But for me, the most important one is trusting and giving the possibility to get responsibilities. If you want someone to grow as an engineering manager, probably the first thing that you need to do is give to that person the responsibility of taking ownership of something, of a small project, and then see how that happens and iterate over it. It's like, okay, we have seen that in this small project, you did this well, this could be done a little bit better. Uh, you could have managed this situation in a different way, uh, providing feedback. I think constant feedback is the most important way of how you can make the people grow. Okay, so you give like real situations, real problems, and then you give feedback. So you do like a small retro and then you provide feedback of what are the strong and less strong point. Of course, there is a calculated risk in some of the of the responsibilities that you are going to delegate to this person. Communicating expectations properly, I think, is the most important thing that you can do ever in any work. This is what I want to, uh, what we expect you to deliver. This is when, this is why, this is everything. So the person has the context and gives some freedom of, let me see what you can do. After that, you can iterate and try to make some tweaks here and there to help to improve that person and yeah, move okay, forward. So I understand that here, what the necessity is, is that the manager sets the expectations, explains like the context and the why, but lets you decide on how you will do it, right? Because otherwise it's like micromanaging, deciding everything. Uh, ex exactly, exactly. Uh, of course, that's why I was saying that you, you need to understand the capabilities of the per of the person before. Like you need to understand if this person is actually capable of creating some plan of mm -hmm. how to achieve that delegation project or whatever that you're giving to him or not. 
if you see that it's still not capable, probably some extra coaching or extra guidance at the beginning. But if you see that the person is capable and the risk of failure of that project is worth so you can you can leave it to that person okay so that's how you get mentorship and how the expectations are set i understand that when you are transitioning to the new role you also get suddenly a lot of new meetings that you didn't have did you have like a template or script that you were following when it comes to doing the one-on-ones were they all the same were they different was it just like talking with people yes i found there are many templates online that you can find how you should follow up one-on-one and this kind of meetings but uh what helped me a lot was being fully honest with the people that i was managing it was like okay this is my first time that i'm gonna do this let's try to make it out good for us and so i have some certain questions that I consider that can provide some value, not always to all individuals, the same questions or the same things are valuable because people is interested in different things. The career paths are different. So that's, that's, that's the first thing that I, I tried to do. It it was like, okay, how many of these things of this template are actually valuable for me? So I understand that as opposed to like looking for one template and applying it to everyone. It's better to start and ask people what they actually look for, who they are, and like what is their expectation or where do they want to go? And then you adapt. Exactly, exactly. So it's good to have the background of a template, like, okay, reading, understanding which type of questions and so on. But I think one-on-ones are, are a personalized meeting. So it's, it's, it's very attached to every person. How should be done for, for different roles, for different people, for different career paths and so on so yeah that's the first thing it's like okay let's make this meeting together good for both of us it's like you're gonna get value i'm gonna get value and most important one i think is embracing the idea of this meeting is for you it's for the individual it's not for me it's not for me getting information it's not for me to monitor you it's not for that it's it's for you it's how you can, how i can help you to to grow what do you need from me what is the purpose of your path in the company it's- this meeting is not to micromanage people <laughs> Yes, no, it's not for that. Really? I always thought that's the purpose. (laughs) People probably do that. It's not what it's for. Sometimes in certain situations of the company, it makes sense to also bring some topics as a manager and say, okay, I think we need to speak about this. I need to, I think we need to cover this, this stuff, but, but most of the time should not be that the, the, the way it should be quite the opposite. Wait a minute. So that means you are not talking about the current occurrences of the sprint or what is happening. You are more talking about like development of the person. That's the purpose of a one-on-one because for, for speaking about sprints or stories or these kind of things that are related to the team, you should have some specific meeting for that where you can speak freely with all the team members and so on. So you can have a, a daily or a stand-up or a, even retro could be helpful if you want mm-hmm. to double check what is going on. So it's good to have also these other type of meetings around the development phase. So you can focus fully in the one-on-ones on the development career, on help the people unblock things, on dealing with situations that are frustrating for them or sharing with some of the developers some guidance lines that are coming from the from the head of management and so on. So it's also a way to spread also part of the cultural and community that is going on inside of the company. Okay, that's interesting. And I think that's um, that's something that every company and every individual does differently. So depending on who you talk to that's probably a different approach so that's really good to have like a scoop of oh what are other people doing so we can yeah we can copy or we can see and have like a reference point right so one more thing about free now i would like to understand the moment that the company decided to move from spotify model where you had like the chapter leads and chapter leads were not in the team they 
were managing people that were of the different technology. So for example, you were Android chapter lead, you were managing all the Android developers across the whole tribe. So across like three, four, five teams. And then you move to be an engineering manager and yeah. manage people inside the team. And then yeah. there was this difference that as opposed to managing Android developers, you suddenly started managing backend developers and uh, iOS developers and QAs, I suppose. So how was that? transition it was it was tough to be honest but it was a really nice challenge because i found it more interesting even really um, okay yeah. tell, tell us about that as a chapter lead i was very focused in one specific area of the things however as a engineering manager you have the capability of half a broader picture of everything that also helped me to understand a little bit more in deep many of the technologies that were around the company like more about backend ios qa practices and so on so i found it interesting because it was a way for me to learn even further to to my previous experience so yeah i found it really really interesting uh it was really really challenging at the beginning because creating a team from zero is really complex it's really hard to put some people together and make them work as a team oh wait uh, so so you so the teams were new as well we did a whole restructure we suddenly came up with some people that were supposed to be a team Part can i my... ask was it top down a decision who will be in which team or could the team decide it was mostly top down because you cannot hmm. ask the people because it, it's impossible to have this kind of decisions up to the people because then Everybody wants to be in one team and then what happened with the other teams. So you need to distribute a little bit in some reasonable way. And it's normal. If after doing that, someone wants to change, you can do it. Because what happened if all the senior backends just ended up in one team and then other teams are not going to have that capability. So you need to distribute based on capabilities, based on the level of the engineers. So usually, yes, it's a top-down decision that needs to be done. Of course, we as engineering managers, we were part of that restructure. We provide some of our more feedback about that. But yeah, that, that was a really, a really challenge because of that. So you uh, suddenly from one day to another, you start like, hey, we are a team and let's go. Mm -hmm. This is really, really, really complex situation, but it was really happily and funnily challenging. A happy challenge. Okay. And yeah. did you have like a support group of other engineering managers? Because all of you were new in the role, right? Nobody, you all transitioned from chapter leads to engineering managers. So how did you create some community of practice of how do, how will we do this? Do we want to have some practices in common or everybody will just do whatever they consider is best? It was more or less like that. Like, okay, we trust in you. Try to do your best. If there are some challenges, bring it to the table. I like that approach because as I mentioned, I prefer to give freedom to the people. So I always appreciate when people give me freedom to do things. But it was really interesting because I was like, okay, how, how are you going to do this? How I know when to set up a retro or what, what's the first thing that I should do? What I did was creating a small plan of what makes sense, what I consider a team needs to be able to operate. At the beginning, the most important part was making a good pair with the product manager. When you're creating a team, it's important to have different things. First one and most important one is a purpose. It's like, okay, what is the purpose of the team? So that's something that I usually do with my pair, which is the product manager is like, okay, what, what is the purpose of our team? Where are we going? What is the, what, what is what we want to achieve as a team? What is the mission and the vision of the team? Apart from the purpose, you need guidance of mission and vision. Then after that, it's like, okay, how we operate, how we operate as a team. We want to have Scrum, Kanban, what is the best one? Why? Let's try it. So we went for Kanban because it was the best one that fit in, in, in the processes that we want to do it. So let's try Kanban. There was, there was also some experienced people in the team that already had experience with Kanban. So they, they helped to provide certain guidance on that, on how to implement it. After that, you need to establish also some common practices of how we do things, like how we do our QA, how we deal with bugs, how we help the people when there is some challenge. 
how we collaborate with each other, how often we want to have a retro, how we prioritize things. It's just starting with that. Let's have a meeting for this. Let's try, let's review it. Let's try and review, try and review. And that's the first thing that you have to do to, have to set up a team. And I have been always super honest with the people that I manage. So I was like, okay, this is a challenge for all of us. We're a new team. We're trying to make the best. It's not going to be perfect. It's not going to be perfect the first the first week, the first month, or probably the first three months. So yeah, it's about that. It's about understanding what a team needs to fit. However, the most challenging part of creating a team is actually creating the team feeling. You should feel that you are part of a team and you are not just some people working together with some uh, guidelines. You know, because after all the things that I have said, Yes, you have some basics, like some rules of how we play, some north and some, but feeling that you are a team is completely different. How we create this team environment where if someone needs some help, I'm going to be proactively asking you, can I help you? Do you need something? What, what is, is, is what I am doing the best for my team? And this is the complex part of it. It's like, how you do that? I also created some sort of meetings at the beginning, chill out calls, like, okay, let's meet, let's meet each other. Let's try to understand who you are. What are your hobbies? Let's make some games. Let's make some laughs. And something that really worked really good for me was delegating the retros for, for every team member. No, it's like, usually we have the retrospective and at the beginning I did it. I did the first four or five just to show how usually should be done and what is the expectation of the meeting and so on and creating some, some kind of guidance. But then after that, I say, okay, let's, let's try to make it that everybody can be the, the facilitator of that meeting. The last one that I did, I, I did it in a paint mode. So I did a really ugly boat with some really ugly island, but everybody was laughing and having fun of that because it was, it was really bad design. And then it became the next person that is going to have the retro. Let's see with which strange idea is going to come with, with some fantasy. Like, and, and we, we saw really, really, interesting people putting many topics like from movies and it was really fun because then the retro yes it has a purpose it was really interesting we got some action points but it was also a way of people expressing themselves being also received and perceived by the people in the team as a good thing like okay you can do an ugly thing and everybody's gonna laugh and it's gonna be fun let, let's see who does the, the funniest thing. It was really good to create an environment of teamwork. And then after these kind of meetings, we were always like, yes, this is a team. You know, it's like, okay, I I, I know you as a person. And wow. it, was, it was really nice. Yeah, That sounds awesome. So yeah. the, the creativity part from your paintings came into play. And <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah. Having yeah. another hobby helps, right? Yes, yes. The good, the good and the bad thing is that that first uh, drawing was not good, so <laughs> that's why it was fun. But, but it was it, fun, yeah. and it was also like a very small threshold to pass, you know. Because imagine that you yeah. create like a real painting and then start yeah. telling people, "Now it's your turn." It's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. kidding me. You know, I will not do that. And exactly. Just to recap. So when you create a team, you have like three milestones. So one was start with a purpose, a mission, and a vision. And that's together with the PM. So we yeah. go where the company wants to go. Then second was working agreement. So establishing the basic rules of play. Mm -hmm. And the third one was the team spirit. So how do yes. we create a team and the belonging that we belong to this team? Exactly. So when you do that, can you explain, did you create like a workshop? Did, was it open so everybody could put their ideas there? Or did you just decide to do it top down? In the first one, which is the purpose, I mean, it was mostly done by engineering manager and product manager because communicating and making a translation of what the company wants and how we fit on that. So what we did was more about sharing with the team, let them know why let them know how we plan to do it, 
what is the, what are the next steps to achieve that and so on and how they can participate on that achievement for the second one absolutely is up to the team is is a team effort i cannot say how what are the rules of the team because everybody is part of the team so i created some workshops at the beginning like the first couple of weeks were mostly workshops like trying to set up the team how we do rituals what is valuable what is not what are our agreements what are our code review agreements what do, how we deal with bugs how we interact with other teams how we interact with other stakeholders how we interact with the customers all those things the rules of how we play are a team effort absolutely yeah i think it's also interesting to know that it's not always that if something is bottom up that people decide everything is always the best way right some things like setting the direction and setting the goal needs to happen at the company level so we are yeah. we make sure that we are aligned with the north star of the company and then within this those boundaries you create the rules so that the team feels comfortable with them just to go out of the engineering management world and get into the agile world which in the end they are interconnected but there is something interesting that you said that you chose kanban so yeah. is scrum dead or what's going on with Scrum? It's interesting because recently I, re I read somewhere in Agile Manifesto, we only have a retro. The rest is irrelevant. And you, from what you're explaining, retro was like the main point of connection for the team and the rest was like up to the team. But I would like to get to know your opinion. I have a very clear opinion about frameworks and this way of working. I don't think Scrum is dead. For certain companies, it makes sense. If they have a really organized cadence of work, probably then makes sense using Scrum. However, okay, at least I know that I used to be a Scrum master. The position is safe. I, I was afraid for a moment. I don't know. I have a, a personal opinion. For me, all these frameworks are guidelines, like a, a framework that you should adapt to the reality of the company of the work that you have to do your business world follow one of these frameworks blindly is a bad thing in my opinion uh, i don't think it makes much sense to just do some things because of the scrum manifesto say so or the agile manifesto whatever i think you need to adapt to the reality of the company for me of the whole agile world what i value the most is the iterativity the iterativity circle that for me is the value how i do it is up to my reality is up to my team is up to my company but keeping in in, in consideration that yeah you, you should do this this circle of getting feedback improvement getting feedback improvement how do we improve what we are doing and that's i think the main focus of being agile. So yeah, I, I, I don't believe in following rules just because they are there. I think you need to adapt. Uh, Let me challenge yeah. you a little bit here. So Scrum has been there for many years already. So people already know it. And yeah. I would say that, especially in free now, I was there, I was a Scrum master and we can talk about that and on another occasion. But I think having that foundation that the teams learn the, because it's very easy to learn interactive work with sprints, with cadence, with the same events coming over and over again. So you learn, it's very prescriptive, we can say, you have a lot of rules, but you learn how to do it. And it's mm -hmm. like the shuhari, you know, you start with like, follow the rule, follow the yeah. rule, then you like, oh, start breaking the rule, and then you set your own rule. And I think, especially in free now, and th that's my, my hypothesis, is that we did Scrum so good and everybody was so proficient in it, that it was just easy to change because everybody understood the value of some of the events. Yeah. And I think if you just go to a random company that nobody ever did anything like that and start doing just the retro and in explaining the value of it, I think it could be quite challenging. Hmm. That's a good point. It could be quite challenging, yes. However, in today's reality in many of the technology companies, it's very rare that at least half of the team already have had some experience with Scrum, Kanban or something agile. So I think those 
people are going to see the value and spread it over the teams. I would it's argue, but... Not in every reality. I understand mm-hmm. that, that not in every reality. That's why I consider every company in every place that you work, you need to understand the current situation and then try to understand how the value of having an iterative way of working can help. You know, it's like, okay, you know, let's try it. Let's try it with one team and see if they see some value and then they can be the the people that spread the, the knowledge. Okay, yeah, that I agree. But I agree that most of the people probably already at least did some kind of Scrum or some kind of Kanban. So that helps to establish some foundations. But there are yeah. also teams that, that struggle. They think they know, yeah. but then the, you go to like first daily and you realize that nobody knows why they are here they are just talking and giving status to their manager and that's actually something i would like to ask you because now you are an engineering manager in bubble we moved to the next yeah. company did you see any differences between how, what how you did it in in free now and how you are doing now i understand just for context you are working mostly in remote right now. Do you see any differences? Because that's also why I'm doing this conversations. Engineering manager in one company is not totally equal to engineering manager in a different company. Yeah. What's your experience with that? Yeah, that's true. That's true. And not only based on my current experience, but uh, of course, uh, understanding the community of engineering managers in different places, uh, it can be really different. Uh, it depends on the size of the company. It depends on the requirements of the company. In some people, engineering managers are almost like a CTO. In others, they are more like a tech lead. The names depend on the company. What I think is, is the real differentiator is the company needs. In some places, engineering manager is like a tech lead. It's like the person who knows the most about certain specifics. It's like, okay, we're looking at engineering manager for backend. Like, Wait, because not everybody knows what's a tech lead. Does it mean this person is not a people manager? They are technology kind of manager? Tech lead usually is, is a name that we say for a person that has a very high skill capabilities in a certain specific area of the development. Like, like an architect. It could be, it could be like principal engineer, super senior engineer. It depends mm-hmm. of the company. It depends how, how they name it, but usually the so tech high is, technology skills, right? Exactly. High technology skill who in some cases also have some people management. Ah, okay. So, okay. <laughs> so you have backend uh, expert that also have a set of developers on his charge that he or she, uh, can manage and organize in a way of succeeding in in a, in, a, mm-hmm. in an area. That that's that's one side of the things. When you have cross-functional teams, usually you have two type of roles. You have or the team lead, which is something similar to what I do, or you have the engineering manager role, which is what I do. The main difference, most of the time in many of the companies that I know, them, is the influence in the company in the in the top management priority. When you have a team lead, that people is usually focusing one team is the charges to deliver, to organize the team, to do that thing. So he is not like in the middle of the sandwich that I was mentioning. He he, he doesn't have the 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 upper bread of the sandwich let's say but it depends when you have Mm -hmm. a set of very talented and seniorish developers you probably don't need that super tech skilled person but you need someone that is more focused in the business in the product in organizative skills so that's how usually google works facebook works and these kind of things like the engineering manager position is purely managerial you should have some knowledge of technical skills that's for sure because you need to understand what your team is doing how your team is doing it what are the what are the interactions that the system that you're creating has with other systems and so on mm-hmm. but mostly your day-to-day job is absolutely not related to in deep technology things in other cases as i was mentioning the day-to-day is to be like the seniorish developer of the team, like, okay, the guy who defines 
the structure of the solution, how things should be done. I talked to Luis Castro to interviews before, and that was kind of his position. So exactly. he was like a tech lead within a team that had a team lead apart from that. Exactly. And the team lead and was more like a people person, like the exactly, exactly. So that's why in some in some companies you have the two roles. You have the team lead. And then you have the, the, the engineering manager role. The team lead is purely focused on deliveries of the team. And, and then you have the engineering manager who is in charge of people management, uh, make the people role, interactions between teams, understanding the company requirements, providing feedback to the company requirements, bringing to the down some of the OKRs, KPIs. So yeah, there are different things and they, they are sometimes mixed in the same role and they are sometimes separated. But then uh, so there can yeah. be teams that have no team lead too, right? Like in Scrum, you never had a team lead and your previous role as a chapter lead was not in the team. It was outside of the team and you were managing across the technology. Yeah, yeah you can have o o horizontal management, but in today's reality, software reality, most of the people is is moving into this direction of having some engineering manager, team lead, tech lead position, because that helps to the team to be more independent. Does it help the team to be independent or does it actually help the organization to have one contact from the whole team? That, 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 that's independence. That's also being independent. It's like, okay, you, you have one person that is the point of contact of it, but you have some sort of independence. Not everyone is asking to different people in the team or there is no way that the team cannot work isolated because they need to interact with other structures and so on all the time. Yeah, so that they, happens they... in the perfect world Well, the lead is actually asking people about their opinion, bringing down all the things that were discussed outside of the team to the team so the team feels like being mm -hmm. part of it. But if you have a team lead that is new or is more like command and control and they think it's all in their hands and they have to like micromanage people to get to the outcomes or outputs that are expected, you know, you are there for like disempowering of the team. And that was one of my challenges or like topics that I wanted to explore. How do you avoid that? How do you avoid that this person becomes like a bottleneck for the team in the end? Uh, well, that's a complex situation because of course uh, you can have this kind of people managing a, a team which is not good. I call it parenting manager. Yeah, there are some people that... Team daddy and team mommy. Kind of thing. Yeah, it's like kind of a, acting as a parent for the team, which I think is wrong. Uh, this was a, a big issue back in the day where scrum masters were called like scrum mummy, you know, because they were doing that kind of thing. Like, okay, I'll shelter you. You don't have to experience any bad exactly. from outside the world. You exactly. can live in your fairy tale. Exactly. Uh, uh, I have a, a philosophy of management uh, regarding this. And it's like, we need to be aware that we are working with adult people, engineers, with people that is prepared for this. So like you don't experts, need experts, right? In their own domain. Exactly. So you don't need to be so careful when communicating things. Also, because most probably you will have a problem later on. And is that the team depends on you fully, which is but not good. Also, part of my philosophy is the team should not need me. I can go on holidays whenever I want and nobody is going to have a problem with that. That's the main goal of my philosophy. Everything is organized in a way that everybody knows what to do and everybody knows who to contact, how to interact with, what to do when something comes up. So I think it's quite totally opposite to this parenting way of managing. I think that is because of a lack of trust in the people. It's something that probably you need to work on, like start delegating, start thinking that you are a bottleneck, you are the problem. If you get sick, your team is not going to work. If you're on holidays, your team is not going to do the right things. It's also a way of, of challenging the mindset. I need to understand that my team needs to be independent even from my 
so from yourself but yeah. i think there is a kind of a need of people to be needed and like if you do that and if the team doesn't need you i understand the team might not need you for a short moment of time because they can survive but then you know all the other topics that you are dealing with usually accumulate and that's why your role still is needed even though when you go on vacation the team can self-organize and keep yeah. on delivering right yeah so there's exactly. i think there is this kind of problem that people might feel that they are really needed so they ask the others to help and they actually provide a lot of help and sometimes too much help instead of giving the rod they give the fish and then like again and again and instead of taking a step back and seeing okay how can i make this work without micromanaging yeah. every day. Yeah, but that, that, that's part of the challenge of the role. That's part of how to become a good manager is trying to understand the balance between taking charge of everything and delegating everything. As a manager, you have information. Not always is going to happen. You know, there is a, we are thinking about this new tool. You don't need to go and communicate directly to the team about that until you are certain that this is going to happen. Because that creates some distraction. It makes no sense, but you need to do it as soon as possible. But when you are sure that this is going to happen, to not create distractions just for, oh, okay, you know, that's not going to happen. And it's okay to deal with that. It's part of, of the role. Guarding the team from information is also important part of the role. You need to cover the team from some noise. Yes. But you don't need to parent in them. You, just, you don't need to be in charge of everything. You mm -hmm. need to show some guidance. You need to prepare the team to face the challenges. Okay. Yeah, this is a complex part of being a manager. And uh, yep. yeah, this is good to hear what different people do and learn from the best. <laughs> Could like, you explain uh, a little bit just so we get like some context? What's the structure? The, the structure that we have is like cross-functional teams. So we have team composed by Android, iOS, backend, uh, QA, a PM, some collaboration with designers, BI, and so on. We have different teams organized by a purpose. So I am the lead of, the lead of one of these teams. Could uh, you say who do you report to just to understand? Because that's probably also different in each company. We have a structure called POTS, very similar to tribes in free now, a group of teams. Okay. So we have like a pot manager. Uh, we have then something above of the pots, which is like a broader community of pots, let's say. Mm -hmm. So I currently report to my pot manager, but I have very frequent interaction with the collective manager. Collective is a, is a group of pots, basically. So we try to interact with each other. We try to have some things, understanding the company needs, uh, how we move forward with some broader initiatives that the company wants to do, bottom-up initiatives that are also needs to be addressed by the company and so on. Okay. Even though we work in a very online and globalized world, I think every company just does what it works for them. And then you see yeah. a different structure from one company yeah. to another. And I would like to just understand, could you explain very briefly Like, what is a day of an engineering manager? <laughs> can we get a well, sneak peek? And it doesn't have to be just Bumble. It can be also like what you know from free now. What well, do you do? Yeah, no, the role is very similar in both experiences. Mm -hmm. It's a day of being prepared for anything. <laughs> so, Are you a firefighter? Kind of thing, yeah. It depends on the situation of the, of the company and the business and some of the deliverables. Some things may come up more frequently than in another moment. So you need to be aware of certain things. But usually the day starts with what I need to catch up. Usually I have a long to-do list of things that I need to review, check, analyze, think about, provide feedback, and so on. Because the role is in a sandwich. You have people from the team that requires from you certain things. And you have people from the top management that is going to require things from you too. So I need to deal with different things from these two layers, basically. It's like, and there are also some horizontal things sometimes, like from other teams, 
from other engineering managers, from IPM. It, it's, it's very challenging because of that, because you have many, many inputs from different places. Usually what I try to do is understand a bit what are the priorities, organize my to-do list and try to focus on doing that. Sometimes it's the team who requires more, more things for myself, like when we are starting a new feature, what we need, what's the next step. We have a plan. It's clear for everyone what needs to be done. Do we need to interact with some other teams? There are other things from the higher management hierarchy, for example, we need to do some changes uh, in the way of how we do certain things within the company. So how I communicate that to my team, how my team is going to be part of that challenge. Or for example, we have issues because the app has too many crashes and bugs, these kind of things. There is also like from the product side, thing. what's the, the next thing that we are going to work on? Where are we going? How the things that we already delivered are doing. Monitor some of the statistics of how everything is going on. Is there is something that need to, that we need to check how many bugs we have in, in our thing. There are different things that are happening at the same time. It's all the time like that. <laughs> so it depends on the week, depends on the day. You need to care more about certain things, some others, and you need to try to maintain a balance between all these things that are going on at the same time. Okay, so... Working on priority of what you have of your to-do list is one of your main topics, I understand. Yes, yes. It's, it's something that sometimes the to-do list is too, is too long and you need to prioritize and understand, okay, how, how you're going to do that. And it's also important to have in consideration that not only this is going on, but you need to care about, okay, the one-on-ones, some outcomes of the retro, like, okay, which action points we have, when are, are, are they being done, by whom, this is going to happen in another team, this is going to happen in the whole company, let's prepare, let's organize, let's try to, to make sense. It's like a small puzzle of things that you need to organize. Okay, that sounds like a lot to do on a daily basis. Yes, sometimes it's too much. <laughs> <laughs> but then I understand it's like being a kind of scrum master partly, you know, or like an agile coach where you just solve problems on a daily basis. And once you solve them, you think, oh, look, I'm so close to take everything from my to-do list. And then you wake up another day and there's, ah, we have new stuff on our to-do list. Is <laughs> it like that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Part of the role requires some agile coach uh, characteristics. Yes. Okay, so we are coming to an end and this was uh, great talking to you. I have two more questions before we go. Do you have any pro tips for the new manager? I think for somebody who's not yet made a decision, they are there being a developer and they're thinking, shall I become a manager what would you tell them if they have doubts about becoming a manager i think the first thing that they should do is at least try one thing give it a try try so to ask have the, your manager to like delegate something to you and see exactly you let's do. take ownership of a certain feature try to understand the whole picture of that let's suppose that you're a back-end developer your team requires to do a new thing you know a new feature a new stuff Take ownership of that from the beginning till the end, even before the delivering, trying to have a whole perspective of everything and understand what happened after delivering. Monitor, check. This is ownership, but it's good to have that ownership. And it's trying, okay, try to understand why you're doing that as your manager, as your PM, why we're doing this, what is the value, how we measure this value. Try to connect all the picture. Then also... Let's go to the QA part. It's like, okay, how do you ensure what you are doing is going to be good enough to prove that you are going to get the value that you are looking for? Which type of test we need? How we ensure that there is there are some of the strange scenarios that we are covering? How this feature interact with other features? And then how we deliver, when we deliver. Why we deliver that day? Is 10% of adoption good or not? Try to understand those things, like the statistics, the, the, met, the monitoring, the measuring of what you do. After having such ownership, if you consider that you want to do that even further, probably you should try it. That's, but, that's a deep understanding, by the way. <laughs> 
but yeah, you need to start with your with, with, with what surrounds you. I'm going to open a little bit more my circle of interaction and my circle of understanding. And I want to see if actually it's something that I'm interested in. For me, the, the, the important part is first try to see a little bit more and see if you like it. Taste a bit of the cake before you get to eat the whole cake, right? Exactly. <laughs> Okay, and last but not least, how do you see the future of managing in remote your part? Well, I think the future is remote. That's something that is happening uh, after pandemic. We can see that all the companies are actually moving into that direction and the companies that are not willing to move in that direction are losing many people. Managing in remote requires a lot of things. For example, we will see that communication written is going to be more important it requires for from the managers to have a good writing qualities to make it clear to make it short enough if you write too much probably nobody's going to read it giving priority to assign communication to synchronous communication it's also mm-hmm. part of being remote because the concept of being remote is like i should not be full time connected to be able to do my job right. i mean there are topics that are urgent and for it makes sense to have a meeting but there are other topics that you can discuss over a week and it's not a problem because it's nothing urgent for me the most complex and challenging part of remote is the team spirit is very 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 hard to create a team spirit in remote because it depends on the companies and the culture that you have some people even don't show their faces when you are in a zoom call or video call so you cannot create a team spirit with that the challenge here is how as a manager i create a culture of creating a safe space where the people can feel free to show their faces, to laugh, to make a joke in the middle of whatever we are discussing, which is something that happens in the real life. But when you're in a Zoom call, as most of the time you need to ask permission for talking because then you are going to mix the communication that doesn't allow just the people that interaction you know to jump then, in wherever like i did exactly, just now right exactly it's yeah. it's very complex because then the other people is going to feel like oh i was talking you know it's, yeah. it's not your turn and sometimes there's a lag so you you said your joke and people didn't even hear it and then uh, exactly. everybody laughs so, three seconds later having this in consideration i think companies should put some focus on so or some effort on having at least one per quarter one per every six months on-site meeting i think it's good to have these kind of things uh, from time to time for example in bumble we just have some working meeting where we were finally able to meet each other after almost one year of working together and the feeling that you get after that as a team is completely different that's the biggest challenge that i see but remote is the future yeah it's here to stay you think yeah absolutely okay. i think so thank you so much I'm staying with many interesting things. It was very informative. I think it's one of those where you can actually get a sneak peek of, okay, now I see what it looks like to be an engineering manager. I really like, especially two things. One was that you said to be curious. And I think that's Mm -hmm. super important. Whatever you do, just be curious and go out of your safe zone to ask people about where we are going and what we are doing. And second one is this team spirit. It's like, we cannot have a team just by assigning people to work together because it's not a team. It's a group of people working together and the difference is big. I think that should be one of the missions every team lead has to actually create a team that feel that they belong to that team. Yeah, yeah, no, totally. I think that's that's super important. Okay, and let's finish on, on that note. Thank you so much. It was very nice to have you. See Thank talk you. to you soon. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. And that's all for today. Thank you for staying until the end. And as always, remember to like and subscribe. And let me know in the comments if you have any questions you would like to ask to engineering managers so I can ask them on your behalf. If you would like to reach out to me or to Miguel, you can find Miguel on LinkedIn, Miguel Angel Gomez Carreño. You have it here just so you can see. I will link all the information in the description. 
So check the links there and stay tuned for the next week where I will interview an uncommon team lead in technology, Jana Reichel, because as we spoke with Miguel today, she's the people lead in the team. And that's another different engineering manager role that I will deconstruct next week. Stay tuned. See you there. Bye-bye.